What's your idea of field research? Why is it appropriate? How should it be done from a psychological as opposed to maybe a business mm -hmm. point of view? Mm -hmm. General issues like that. Then we'll move into specifics related to content analysis and uh, non-obtrusive, long-time trend stuff and survey mm -hmm. research. Okay. Um, I guess I would describe the reasons for having a uh, social science approach to field research in contrast to a journalistic approach or a business approach is to be able to draw tools of generalization to be able to make a, a f finer investigation into underlying factors than either uh, the journalist uh, or the case study person is likely to do. In the first case, uh, the journalist is likely to stop with an analysis of, of issues that uh, don't look at this particular case in the context of some broader social, social dynamics. And uh, therefore, there's also a set of comparative tools, methodological tools, that may complement or shed light uh, on the kinds of insights that uh, a particular case study or journalistic approach might uh, uncover. So I see them as rather complementary um, set of approaches rather than uh, mutually exclusive or oppositional in any sense of the word. And I think that a, a good balance of case studies uh, combined with uh, broader approaches, uh, com comparative approaches, uh, using usually many cases in a sort of quantitative uh, investigation, uh, balance each other out in this way. In the typical psychology degree mm -hmm. program like this one, mm -hmm. what kind of learning techniques are available to the typical graduate student within the department? Or do you usually have to go outside the department to get? I don't think our field research training is as strong as it might be, but there's a, there is a good basis, at least in observational techniques, in, in content analysis techniques, in quasi-experimental designs or experimental designs here. Where we're lacking is we don't, cannot compete with a group like Michigan in a strong survey research program uh, and so on. But our students are prepared enough so they can draw upon those kinds of resources when they come to the appropriate research problem. And I think they're trained to recognize when they have uh, a kind of problem that may need those, those particular resources. We have Jim Davis here, who's the ex-director of the National Opinion Research Council at Chicago. We have a number of resources which tie us into these kinds of uh, special uh, facilities, even though we do not maintain such facilities ourselves here at, uh, at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like you to talk now about, this will be a bulk of the interview, mm -hmm. talk about in very specific terms, so somebody who is not familiar with content analysis at all can understand how you developed it, why it was interesting to develop, how it's related to field research, and how it's a tool that can be used by field researchers. So take your time, a very general, as you were explaining it to a Psych 101 class, what is content analysis, how you came about to develop the general inquirer, mm. and how it's useful in archival data with field researchers and so forth. Yes, the content analysis is a generalized procedure, it refers to a set of procedures for making inferences uh, from textual materials about the general patterning of values or motives or other characteristics of the text, usually by comparing one group with another group. Uh, so you can say that this group shows more of a particular characteristic than the uh, reference group or less of a characteristic. The purpose of content analysis can be perhaps illustrated by contrasting to other things or related things that content analysis is not. There, for on the one hand, there is the uh, information retrieval kinds of systems where you're looking for a particular document and you want to cue in and on some index words or whatever to retrieve that document. In a sense, it is a content analysis because you are uh, searching text for specified characteristics. But your objective is to make one retrieval or, or find the document you're looking for. Another related field, which might be considered content analysis but was not 
the main thrust of what we usually do, concerns the identification of particular authors or uh, who wrote a particular document, like who wrote the Federalist Papers. There, again, you make a search of text characteristics, but they are characteristics which are uh, usually very idiosyncratic and do not reflect underlying values or motives. For example, in separating the Federalist Papers, uh, the word while versus whilst became a major, a major uh, tool for separating who wrote which paper, simply because one author preferred one term and one author habitually used the other, and that this made for a powerful uh, basis of separation. An example of a uh, kind of content analysis that we do in the field would be illustrated by uh, a case recently in the Mississippi um, courts. There is a standard textbook of Mississippi history written by Professor, Be Professor Bettersworth at the University of Mississippi at Oxford. Uh, which has been uh, adapted by the State School Board of Mississippi for teaching state history. And this book had a point of view regarding the position of blacks in the society, which uh, some people were not particularly happy with, and a group at Tougaloo University endeavored to write a uh, contrary state history. Now, the state board in Mississippi can adopt up to three different books, giving the teacher in the schoolroom a choice. And the, uh, but the board refused to adopt also this uh, alternative book. And a case was made that the uh, treatment of particularly blacks in this alternative book was quite different from the way that uh, uh, Mr. Bettersworth had, and we were asked to content analyze, compare the existing textbook, Mr. Bettersworth, with this alternative textbook to see uh, if what differences we could document. Now, this is a curious kind of uh, uh, problem because there are many differences between the textbook, and just to mention blacks more is not, in a sense, a example of, of really uh, uh, giving better attention to blacks or treating, treating blacks better. So we had to look for characteristics which were um, uh, the this, this legal system would identify as relevant to the case. And we looked for something fairly simple, because it's not a very good idea to deluge a, a court trial with tables of statistics. So we took a very simple case, which seemed to illustrate the point. Namely, we went through both books and looked at every instance of reference to the word Mississippian. We based this on the point that the State History Board, uh, the school board, uh, had in their criteria emphasized that this textbook should give the young student uh, what we might call a sense of identification with Mississippi, make the student proud of being a Mississippian. Well, given this, then it should be that a reference to Mississippian in the book should be a reference to a person that in today's context would include the student or the student's family, or in earlier historical context include the ancestors of that student. So the student could be proud to have an ancestry that were, were Mississippians, if assuming the student's a native from the state. Um, so we, we examined every reference to Mississippian, and we separated off those that explicitly referred to white Mississippians or black Mississippians as a subset, or uh, Mississippian uh, lawyers or, or other subgroups of, of Mississippians, and just took the general, on, general term, not amplified in further detail. We had several hundred instances in each book. And we found, generally, that the student reading the old textbook could read the word Mississippian and quite rightly conclude that this couldn't possibly mean either himself, his parents, or his ancestors. It excluded them. Uh, one example statement is um, Mississippians uh, were very disappointed and angry about the 1954 Supreme Court decision. 
well, how can a black Mississippian read that and, and say, that's, that's my parents uh, kind of thing? Well, tabular, counting it up, was rather conclusive evidence um, that Mississippian uh, uh, was, in fact, excluding blacks uh, in Bettersworth book, but including blacks in the other book, even though there were in the alternative books a number of cases where the uh, uh, term, even though the book was written by, mostly by blacks, in term um, inadvertently referred to white Mississippians, could not really include uh, that uh, other group, such as the Mississippians going to serve in a certain army in American history. There were two cases in the alternative book where the term Mississippian only would refer to black Mississippians. It was a reverse kind of misclassification, and we pointed that out. When we do a content analysis, we generally prepare the entire body of text for a computer. Not that the computer does the analysis, but the computer is an aid in the uh, information handling to find trends or patterns in the data. And in some cases, uh, uh, the computer is only sort of culling out the instances which we will then make a decision about in terms of whether they're to classify them one way or the other. In other instances, we're able to use dictionaries or other uh, lookup to procedures to uh, have the computer automatically assign descriptors. So this case of Mississippian was rather, Mississippi textbook history was rather interesting because uh, we did this at the request of the uh, plaintiff in the case. And the, uh, we ran the entire text through, and so long we had it on a computer, we looked at um, various characteristics of both texts, taking comparable chapters of each period of history, the uh, 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 Civil War, the after Civil War era, et cetera, and comparing them chapter by chapter. And I noticed the computer is very good identifying both occurrences of things, but it's almost better than humans at noticing the absence of things. We see so many things every day, uh, we tend not to notice the absence of it. We may see a newspaper story, for example, that's going on for some days, but the newspaper story fades from the news, and we don't really notice that it disappeared. And somebody will say, whatever happened to that story? The computer would pick that up, that the, the omission, as well as the more salient inclusion of an event, is, is in the text. So the, I noticed right away that the uh, computer had signaled that Bettersworth was different from this alternative book in um, noting the uh, occurrences, more current, Bettersworth had more occurrences or references to women in society. And if you looked at the book, it was clear that Bettersworth was spending more time on what you might call Mississippi culture, and f including folk cultures. And there was quite a treatment of what you might call the um, Magnolia era woman in Mississippi history in this lovely genteel fashion, which the alternative book, in its concern for uh, political history, had ignored and focused primarily on political history, which was primarily carried out by men in Mississippi. So I called down to Mississippi, uh, this is relatively early in the analysis, and said that we, the analysis is very interesting and supportive in current terms of treatment of blacks, but uh, really that their book was rather scant uh, in treatment of women. And uh, this was some years ago, and, he, and the uh, author sort of laughed, and he said, well, it's funny you should mention that. The women are in my office protesting right now, that they'd finally realized that uh, there wasn't a very good treatment, or we've promised them a major revision to bring more women into the book. Okay, the computer had signaled that where you and I might have just, just uh, uh, not not noticed. Okay, so these are the kinds of um, multi-directional comparisons that uh, our techniques have developed for looking at different uh, kinds of uh, treatment of issues in text. Now, in other field settings, in business, we've been using this uh, for many years. I was on the board of a company called the Simulmatics Corporation, and we use this to study product imagery. And uh, one, of the comp one company that uses, uh, has used our system is the Societal Analysis Division of General Motors, 
where they have been, for example, looking at people's sensitivity to safety issues regarding automobiles, uh, driving attitudes, these sort of things, as they appear in a variety of different press in the country and producing reports to sort of monitor uh, changes in public attitudes. Um, this, these things can be uh, an adjunct uh, in ways which, which are rather remarkable, helping people to digest much more information on occasion than um, uh, one might expect. For example, this General Motors project, which is reported in public opinion quarterly, uh, gathered all the information uh, from a newspaper by essentially capturing the newspaper uh, as it was put uh, to press. The paper, with these modern computer systems, the, the reporters enter their stories right in a computer, and they're edited in a computer before they're sent out, in the case of a Detroit paper, to a uh, printing plant some miles from the editorial office. And we just put a computer in that essentially was a second printing plant and captured uh, the newspaper. Another kind of study, uh, which is now quite feasible, is to compare documents going back a long period in time. Uh, it should be evident that one of the advantages of content analysis over asking people questions, what do they think, is that we can go back well before anybody ever thought of the idea of doing survey research. For example, we've done studies of letters written by people over uh, their, most of their lives. Uh, in another study, we have recently used a new optical reading system, uh, a spin-off technology from uh, the development of machines that uh, read for the blind. Uh, instead of pronouncing what the machine reads, it stores the text uh, optically read on tape. And uh, we have captured uh, this way uh, all the American Party platforms going back to uh, when they first appeared and on detailed uh, time trend analyses of the changes of American uh, values um, uh, in these documents. This is just one illustration of the kinds of uh, investigations that take place. Yeah? That was interesting. I, w I wanted to probe more on any specific business-related uh, approaches you've used, if there are others and how a typical field researcher might find them useful. It's, it's not very f a very familiar t technique to many people, I don't think, outside of a, a psychology program. Do you think people at the business school are aware, of, or at business schools are aware? Most of the research in content analysis is not done in psychology departments, but in schools of communications. There is a thesis done some years ago by a man named Barkas, who, is, who was at the time over at the Boston University School of Communications, called the Content Analysis of Content Analysis, in which it reviewed and summarized over 1,200 studies that are done. Uh, there have been content analyses, for example, of violence on television. Uh, detailed studies going now down in the Annenberg School of Communications in Philadelphia on television impact under Gerbner and his colleagues. There's a uh, number of studies now going on in Scandinavia for um, political comparisons between the uh, Scandinavian countries of, of, of documents, ideology is expressed in the press. Um, content analysis within the social sciences has tended to wax and wane, I think, in response to the role of uh, the extent that people are willing to look at ideology as a causal factor into how people behave. Um, I was trained with people who, who endorse the idea of uh, what people think is being important to their behavior, how they construe the world. Uh, people like uh, Carl Rogers when I was at Chicago or Bales here. For, uh, and the, uh, therefore, it was important to uh, develop these procedures in ways that uh, uh, would not be intrusive and would not um, uh, and not sort of distort their, their ideology. Now, there's a fundamental question or problem here. Because if you're doing any kind of classification, let's say you read James Reston in the New York Times, and you're a regular reader, and 
you read several editorials and you say, well, I think he's sort of gone soft on, or he's gotten rather conservative about. You're doing a mini content analysis. Um, you're essentially taking words and phrases that he wrote and saying, gee whiz, that's a softer line on, or that's a more conservative approach than similar words and phrases that I remember reading in past articles. So you're doing an intuitive content analysis, as it were. And yet you are interpreting at the same time what you think is important about Reston's writing in terms of classifying it as being more liberal or conservative or what have you. And uh, these kinds of judgments have led to a number of criticisms that uh, content analysis is, is easily swayed by the particular dictionaries or classification systems that are used. There have been some interesting studies by uh, Robert Weber recently, where he has, using multi uh, multivariant analysis procedures, employed several different analytic schemes to the same data, and found that he, he was able to come out with remarkable sim remarkably similar conclusions, even though he used completely different uh, dictionaries and, and other tools within the framework of our system. We, for example, have dictionaries that uh, are derived partly from the work of uh, Parsons, or dictionaries that are derived uh, from the work of Osgood using the semantic deferential, or dictionaries that are derived from the work of Harold Laswell at Yale University. Uh, in the case of this comparison that Weber made, he was comparing the Laswell approach to the approach of um, the Harvard dictionaries uh, uh, in contrast to the Yale group. And in these, in these cases, it seems that because so many classifications cross-cut each other, that similar conclusions are likely to be derived. On the other hand, a very specific scoring systems, such for the, we have a computer procedure for scoring need achievement in McClellan's uh, uh, class motive scoring procedure. Um, obviously, the kinds of scores derived in that would not relate to a particular businessman studying safety imagery, and the dictionaries are all classifying uh, concepts like say, safe, safety belts and speed and this sort of thing, completely different, non-overlapping scoring. So these are some of the, the issues that have uh, come across. Now, with, it's interesting to follow the role or changes regarding ideology in the social sciences, compare these changes in the United States versus Europe. Um, for the past few years, it seems to me that ideology has gotten a, a very suspicious treatment in the United States. People are, uh, as many, some people claim that ideology is an epiphenomenon that just reflects um, social structural factors and that are literally rationalizations for, for a structural situation. Um, I disagree with that, obviously. I, I, I think that people uh, can or have the intelligence enough to construe the world in ways beyond that which is deterministic and of their social situation in which they're raised or in which they work and, um, and can go beyond uh, in, in exciting ways, uh, these constraints. And it's that aspect of, of human beings that I'm more interested in studying. Content analysis is, doesn't seem relatively accessible to the typical field research, at least at the scale mm -hmm. you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Future directions now, is it going to become more accessible? How are people going to know more about it? How can you set it up in an interesting way so it would be useful to more of the General Motors type projects? Do you get more national recognition? Well, there's been several problems. One is in having mach text machine readable. And this has been rapidly expanding, partly because more people are putting text online. You can now, if you have a home computer, call and get the New York Times or the Washington Post summarized on your computer screen uh, through any one of a series of resources. These kinds of uh, developments are resulting in that a much greater repository of text material is being uh, stored on computer form as well as uh, in, in printed form. 
uh, things like the uh, wire services are now completely archived in computer form. Some wire services have been archived for a number of years. Others are, are, are more recently archived, and they can be bought or analyzed in this way. So it's only been in, in certain recent years that uh, people have been able to overcome the basic problem that uh, computers do not read books like you and I do. And even the optical reading systems devised today uh, are limited in what they can handle. Uh, for example, the uh, system for the blind people is still not able to identify columns in newspapers and separate this feature. Now, it's, 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 it turns out to be technically quite diffi difficult, I gather. And uh, it's important both for people who cannot see the newspaper to have the computer identify column boundaries and not skip over to the next column. And it's important for us in order to get the story cohesively together. Nor can these uh, machines read older books. We have a collection, I believe, of 35,000 school textbooks here at Harvard going back to about 1810 over in the School of Education. I've looked at these and sampled pages of them. And it's quite evident that when we get back to about um, turn of the century, um, that it's very hard for the computer to pick this up. And we get back before 1830 when the spelling characteristics, the S's and such were different. The computer completely is, is buffaloed. So while we like to look at long-term trends, we're better off looking at things like, um, for example, the party platforms were, were uh, reprinted in, in modern paper. That we can read. But to read any kind of document, an ordinary newspaper, an old uh, document, is, is just not a matter of course still. The other thing that's happening, of course, is the computer costs are coming down. When we, f we started this project years ago, um, machines were relatively slow. The size of the dictionaries the machines could handle with any reasonable speed were, were rel relatively modest, uh, and so on. Today, um, we have much more sophisticated procedures, often processing text at the rate of uh, 10 to 20,000 words per minute, um, doing identification of word senses as it goes so it can distinguish the board that's a piece of lumber from the board of people sitting around a table. Um, all these, these kinds of resolutions made as the computer pro uh, processes text. And classification systems that include dictionaries up to the size of, of anything you want because uh, the uh, computers are so large. So rather than be technology bound in terms of processing as opposed to data acquisition, uh, we are more bound in terms of the amount of effort we can put into building large dictionaries or uh, transcribing uh, various theories into operational coding rules that the dictionary can, can understand. And but, how, do you, how do you see 15, 20 years from now, what will be the role of this technique in relation to other field techniques? Well, there's source cause for concern. I was one of those who protested very much the government getting in the business of developing machines that can um, take speech and translate it into uh, computer storageable form uh, as, as text. I think if a person writes something down and chooses not to burn it, uh, that person takes a risk, and in some, some sense, it's somewhat fair game for, for people in my trade, okay? That, uh, that uh, unless they put it in a safe or something or, or otherwise encrypt it, that this is a historical document, and, and what's, what's fair game for the historian would be fair game for, for our purposes. Uh, how the if you have a conversation in a private room or you have to worry about a room being bugged and it's 1984, um, one of the concerns was that the thing saving um, that keeps, for example, a totalitarian government from bugging every room in a large hotel is that they can't afford to have people sitting, uh, listening to all the conversations in all the different rooms. However, if the government has developed a system which uh, can stand by and listen, and you can build thousands of little computers to do this, and immediately identify anything that sounds suspicious, 
I think you've got a problem on your hands. And I'm not so sure that's a very good idea. Um, so that there are these, these ethical problems that make me wonder how much we really want to push this technology. What, we were, what we've been doing is so many years of uh, difference between light years away, I should say, from what, what this, tech, this large volume processing would represent, that there is nothing um, in our procedures uh, which would make this uh, eminent in any ways or form. But it's, it's certainly, there are some, you might say, pilot study lessons as to the kinds of inferences people can draw from text and the kinds of signatures uh, uh, that people leave uh, indirectly in or indirectly in, in what they say that they might not want to have recorded. But uh, the government continues on with this, everything mm -hmm. from voice print to uh, where people can talk into a microphone and, and sign something literally, ident be identified as literally as they had uh, uh, signed it. There were voice prints, I, you may remember in that movie, um, 2001, I yeah. believe, um, to the actual transcription uh, of what is being said so it can be looked at for the kinds of uh, ideology expressed. Okay, I think we have enough on the content analysis. I wanted to shift gears a little into s survey research. And mm. you've, you've spoken on that and you've done some work in that area. Mm -hmm. A general description of survey research and how it can be used as a field research technique. Okay, content analysis can be somewhat analogized to, to archaeology. People leave traces around and we sort of pick them up and look at them for the patterns of inference we can make either about the writer, the situation in which the person was writing, uh, consequences they were trying to produce, and so on, okay? Survey research is the first level, you might say, of intrusiveness in the sense that you're going and rapping on someone's door and asking them to take some time out to answer some questions. Now, these questions, uh, survey research can therefore only be prospective. You have to sort of think of the idea of the survey before you can tap in. And you can't say, what did people think about a long time ago? If you're lucky, there was a survey perhaps done that taps those questions, thus you can do what they call secondary analysis and bring several surveys together to show some time trends. But for the most part, it's prospective. It's based on making a minor intrusion into people's lives and asking them some questions. I emphasize the intrusiveness aspect because, in fact, I think that the longer kind of survey is in some uh, problems. It has a uh, higher refusal rate in recent years, and partly in urban environments, et cetera, that there's a difficulty in uh, uh, making generalizations when so many of the people have turned you down. This has been replaced much by the uh, telephone kind of interview, which, especially with long distance dialing, et cetera, is done at considerably less, less cost than a face-to-face -face interview. And I've been impressed that a number of agencies now do interviews much longer than people thought were possible a few years ago. There's been several books published on telephone interviewing. The um, types of surveys that you ask questions uh, are likely to ask, find involve essentially, I think, can be classified in two ways. One is you ask attitudinal questions. What do you think about? Opinion. These are often in the form of consumer research or whether they liked a certain product. The other is a behavioral question, whether they used the product, what uh, their expenses were in a certain field, uh, whether they bought a car recently. Um, and there's some very famous studies that continue on this basis, a panel study on income dynamics. In between, you have some intentional kinds of questions. Do you tend to buy a car in the next three weeks? Have you been looking for a car and are you about to make the purchase? This sort of thing. <laughs> um, but anyway, this broad, this broad kind of uh, separation has been a major split in people describing quality of life uh, indices. Inferences concerning the quality of life have mainly been 
from two sources of the survey research questionnaire. One is questions asking whether people are satisfied or happy with their lives, where they have their sorrows and where they find their joys. The other is to ask them for evidence or behavioral uh, reports uh, concerning the way they spend their money, the way they allocate their time, these kinds of uh, demonstrations as to perhaps whether their life is, is changing in its, its quality or its uh, organization, etc. And I have been involved with uh, a large study of time allocation procedures in this behavioral mode. We go to people and we ask them to keep a diary for a specified amount of time as to who they're seeing or how they're allocating their time, uh, where they spend their time, and so forth. Um, this can be used for rather practical reasons. For example, the Atomic Energy Commission was interested in using some of our data to find out where Americans were during different times of the day relevant to building bomb shelter type things. Uh, the data, however, has been uh, for a study of the study of time budgets, however, has been a uh, tradition that has not uh, was not founded in this country, but stems from work done in uh, the Soviet Union in particular. Uh, one sociologist who was an immigrant from the Soviet Union, named Sorokin brought over this technique and did the first major time budget studies in this country uh, during the Depression as part of, I believe, a W Works Pro Progress uh, Administration project. The uh, kinds of inferences you draw from these surveys um, can be rather indicative of uh, allocations of, of resources and Pardon me, let me say that over. The kinds of inferences you draw from these surveys are s sensitive to minor changes in allocations of resources, allocations of uh, time patterning, uh, in ways which complement a great deal of other data. For example, we know from the Nielsen ratings how many hours a day a television set is turned on and what channels it's going to. Uh, this is done by essentially hooking a wire to the television set that the Nielsen people can use to contact the people involved, uh, the television, the household involved, and record during the 24 hours of the day what they're uh, tapping. What, one of the things that makes it the use of behavioral measures particularly interesting is this is a area where there can be agreement among people coming from quite different backgrounds and quite different uh, approaches. The time budget work we did was initiated uh, on a cooperative international basis by the socialist countries through the Vienna Center for Cooperation between East and West and we've been able to complete now a fairly large number of studies involving about 15 countries or so, half are from the socialist, half from the capitalist countries. And there's major uh, kinds of insights that can be derived, especially as these studies accumulate over time. For example, we can show quite clearly that the, Rus that the revolution in Russia, which is supposed to benefit the people, has been actually quite poor at benefiting women who are working and raising a family. These people are, by any criteria, under quite a bit of duress in just meeting their daily schedules and getting enough sleep and having a minimum of time, amount of time for leisure. And the state of these women has not improved that much uh, over about a 50-year period in uh, the Soviet Union. Similarly, we can look at class differences within this country or at family compositions within this country to examine uh, changes that may occur either from work. Uh, another example of major changes is in television viewing, uh, which continues to increase, uh, in uh, flexi time scheduling, four-day work weeks. A number of these other topics have been the, uh, a point of investigation. 
Uh, we can investigate the arrival of, uh, impact of the arrival of new technology. Uh, other kinds of shifts which um, allow us essentially to monitor um, behavior. Now, there is a problem here in the sense that what we gather are usually self-reports of how people spent their time. They keep a diary for the day that they're investigating. And that this kind of a uh, procedure is uh, subject to a certain amount of rationalization certain amount of uh, clarification. Uh, this, this is a problem of, of these uh, uh, kinds of approaches. They have been uh, verified with other kinds of investigation, observational techniques, et cetera, et cetera. We know roughly what their level of accuracy uh, is. We know the ways in which they tend to be rationalized. But uh, I think they're an important adjunct to the kinds of work that a person may do and will help uh, uh, the investigation of a variety of problems in, uh, in different kinds of applied research settings. Okay. I think that the main issue regarding the bridging of uh, applied research, such as in business and some of the more general social science work that is done in traditional academic departments, is not so much a matter of carrying the tools, of methodological tools, from one side to the other. Uh, these tools, I think, can be acquired fairly rapidly, and I think with uh, more interest in, in making the bridge among, among students and faculty, that uh, this kind of uh, transfer will take place. Um, there is an awareness that uh, gee, some interesting examples have been done with multivariant techniques or, or with other kinds of survey procedures, and people are interested in picking these up. The uh, point of immediate problem is, I think, in the terms of the conceptualization of theory. Essentially, a consultant to business or um, government or other, other groups is often going to uh, make their reputation on the basis of what I would call a uh, awareness expansion. They go to their client and they say, they listen to what the client has, has done, and then they say, ah, but you didn't consider these factors, and they reel off X, Y, and Z. And the client is satisfied at that point in the sense that the client says, gee, I really hadn't thought of these, and he goes back and, and incorporates those additional ideas to the extent that they fit into the, to the particular problem in, in the client's own view. In other words, uh, consulting is often in a matter of awareness expansion kind of, uh, of role to try and uh, uh, get the client to consider more factors than those that have gone into the decision making to that point. This, our, this formulation of uh, problems does not seem to lend itself as well to the kinds of ways that people doing traditional research designs like to think. There's need to essentially conceptualize problems at a somewhat different level. There's a need to make formulations that draw contrast into the usual question of, do you see more of it in this situation or do you s in that situation kind of thing, rather than, have you also considered this? And this kind of, uh, this means maybe there are different kinds of uh, levels of abstraction or different kinds of ways uh, variables are brought together in a larger system to suit the purposes on, in one culture versus the other. The problem is if the, if the formulation continues uh, in a way which is not operational in the other culture, there tends to be a very strong difficulty in bridging this, this gap. And it's at the level of uh, a theoretical conceptualization that I think the major uh, need now exists for more uh, inter interdisciplinary endeavors. I don't think this is necessarily at the level of, of having conferences and saying, here are our terms and here are uh, your terms. But to take a look at some real research problems 
and say, how would, what concepts would you bring to bear about them? How would you formulate them together? What theories would you use, et cetera? And, and bring the two s cultures together uh, to see if there can be a, a common uh, set of terms for, for analyzing particular cases or looking at general uh, research projects uh, where a number of comparisons are being made. Um, I think one of the key issues in terms of how business will be relating to social science is to participate in some of the data gathering and coordination that must be occurring during the forthcoming years. For example, the new time budget study that we're doing of a national panel of just the United States, not the other countries, um, costs, it will cost about $2 million. It's not something that a company is likely to go out and do themselves. Instead, what is probably going to be developing are very subscription services where a uh, amalgamated or a, project or a general project will be done that will be of interest to a number of corporations. Now, several survey companies are already marketing this kind of thing on a subscription basis. The same people that did the surveys for, for Carter, for example, uh, have a periodic uh, subscription survey where there was a bit of a, a flap because some of their subscribers were the Arab countries and the question was how much should a foreign agency know about the thoughts of the American people on, on a variety of topics. But uh, these questions aside, given the large cost in doing a, a time analysis covering the seasons of the year, the different days of the week, the different members of the household, uh, the, it is well now beyond the power of such agencies, which, which I uh, uh, am involved with, such as the National Science Foundation, so well beyond the ability of our committee to fund uh, time budgets, uh, income dynamic studies, these kinds of things on a continuing basis. And what is going to have to emerge is some sort of uh, conglomerate funding representing different mission-oriented agencies within the government, as well as different parts of the business world, much as, uh, as already takes place in Japan. And this kind of cooperative research design, a cooperative definition of problems, uh, application of the techniques in these ways, uh, seems to me to be one of the major kinds of uh, approaches that a young uh, master's and, or doctor's in business administration student should be uh, aware of so that when they get into a situation where certain kinds of the certain kinds of data may be relevant, they will know that uh, these alternatives exist, and they can participate in mm -hmm. in these things as they come about during the next years. One last question, mm -hmm. and that is simply, in relation to your own research, or in relation to content analysis or business research, what do you find fun about research? What do you enjoy about research? What is, stim is stimulating about it for you? And how do you, how, what do you hope to learn in the future from research? Oh, I, I've generally enjoyed it tremendously, but what particular what thing... What do you like about research that's fun? The aha phenomenon, the saying, gee, nobody on the history of the human race on Earth has ever sort of had that insight before. And because I went down a certain path, you, you sort of uncovered that rock. Uh, you found what was underneath. That sort of thing is, 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 is great. Fun. It's a privilege to be able to go down that path and have a society that lets at least some people do such explorations. What, what I think is interesting is what kind of more innovative endeavors may take place uh, at institutions like this one during the next 10 years. Certainly the experiment in social relations, which is a meld of anthropology, of psychology, of sociology, uh, was an exciting period but led to a focus that some people complained was too much concerned or preoccupied with a microanalysis of human interrelationships. We've gone now to a series of other stages where I think there'll be a new agenda in the 80s which may focus around certain major topics of, of interest that coalesce people from various disciplines. I think one of the most exciting ones for the next decade is, it's unfortunately somewhat a buzzword already, but is the issue of productivity. And that to work out an agenda for research on productivity that goes from structural, large issues down to uh, the 
sense of productivity for the individual worker or craftsperson on a, on a project is an exciting challenge at which uh, people can can agree upon okay other kinds of uh, formulations in the past have not done so well and I think it's interesting to look at why they haven't done well things like work redesign or uh, things that are involving certain organizational variables have not tended to to lead to a uh, development of theory in the way that I think is most fruitful but I think that, that there's a there's a motive now there's a, a push to develop uh, a formulation uh, in the 80s which will be an exciting blend of applied and more abstract theory and that uh, this will be used to marshal uh, such issues as uh, how can a society which is rather adversarial in its orientation between people uh, compete uh, in terms of its productivity with a society that is uh, more homogeneous and cooperative in the way it works, this, this kind of thing.